Good morning. Hey, good morning, Doug. How are you today? Doing good. Fully functional. Well, I'm still kind of, I was sick the last couple days because I went to the dentist. I think I got something on went there. So coming yeah. down a little bit. I saw an old guy in the gym one time who looked really fit. And I was like, what's the secret to doing good long term? And he said, stay out of the doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, I'll do that. Oh, marvelous. So perhaps you waded into the homework assignment a little bit, and there's a couple of things that I've got to show you that you don't know, um, but you probably knew half as much as you needed to know, maybe a little bit more. There's like exactly half the questions that we could do. Sounds about right. Yeah, some of them look a little weird. Um, but they weren't after today, so. Let's dive in and take a look at this. So I mentioned that uh, we'll tackle this question, which is a number of the questions in your assignment. But before we do that, copied it over. Before we do that, I just want to take a look at, I don't know, well, this. This example of a series. Um, and this is kind of an, an odd one. And you do have a homework assignment about this and I think that's kind of a cool part of this but I guess I should turn off my music but think about this statement this is something you've played with a little bit over time of course remember that that means 6.474747 notice the bars over both the four and the seven not just the seven and so that actually can be thought of as an infinite series as well because based on decimal places isn't this the hundredth place thousandth this is the ten thousandth place and this would be the hundred thousandths millionths place and so on and so forth. So actually, isn't that number really considered to be six plus 47 hundredths plus 47 ten thousandths plus 47 millionths and so on and so forth. And again, it's infinite because it goes forever. Um, so, my question to you, I want to see if you can pull this off, is could you write, well, at least this part of it? Could you write that? I want to give you a second to think about it rather than just immediately do it. Could you write that in sigma notation? Like if you see a infinite series, again, series, not sequence series, because it's got plus signs, and it would have plus signs here naturally. I'm not putting them there just for the fun of it. Could you write that in sigma notation? And also, do you notice it's a geometric series? Think about what you're multiplying by each time. If you can't, if you don't see what you're multiplying by each time to move from term to term to term, then you're not going to be able to write this in sigma notation.
So first of all, did you see that the ratio as you move from one term to the next is either 1 one hundredth or 0 0.01? In other words, that's what you're multiplying by, right? Aren't you saying yeah. times 1 one hundredth each time? So that's what makes it geometric. And just as importantly, now I know what the ratio is, what the multiplier is. Let's see, so how could you write this? Well, there's a 47 there. So I could think of it as, and again, I'm just trying to think of this out loud along with you. I could think of this as 47 times 1 one hundredth. Isn't that the first term? 47 one, one hundredths. So I could say then this is n, and then I would start at n as 1 and go forever. Wouldn't that work? You don't have the 6 in there, though. Yeah, and I just put parentheses around the the 47s so you could kind of throw the six out front too if you wanted to get the whole thing but I actually meant it just to be just to be the part that's so yeah the six kind of screws that up because it's really not part of the part of the system so it's kind of separate six is not part of the geometric you're not multiplying six by something to get 47 over 100 so yeah it's just the repeating part um could you start at zero Is there another way to do that? Oh, I don't think we could start at zero because then you'd have 47 times one. Yeah, because then it'd be 47 times one and that, and that first number is 0.47, but notice that, notice that you could Again, you don't have any good reason to do this, so don't don't get me wrong. It's not like there's some advantage to this. So you definitely need one one hundredth in this because that's the multiplier. And so you could start at zero. But as you said, at zero, that would be one, right? Well, if that's only one, that first number is 0.47. Well, then that's your answer. If if you put 0.47 out front, in other words, you multiplied, you need a, you need a one one hundredth there. In other words, you need 47 one hundredths out front, if you will. Maybe I'll write it that way. I guess it doesn't matter. That would work too. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think it makes any difference. But that's just kind of interesting to notice that even decimals, repeating decimals that you've seen, those are also geometric series and so they can be written in this notation and then again we can kind of add them up we you know one of the, the the place you've seen these before and i don't think i'll go down this road is is to convert that to a fraction convert 6 and 47 repeating convert that to a fraction because if the if the decimal is repeating then that means there is a fraction that this came from it's only if it doesn't repeat like pi or e that that there is no fraction for it but these numbers are called rational rational mathematicians call them rational which really means ratioable so you could write this as a ratio in other words as a fraction of a couple of numbers um so you could use your geometric series knowledge now to to figure out what that was and of course it's easy to check because whatever whatever you get and again we're just work, worried about the 0.47 part we know there's a six in front of it um so maybe I'll just kind of arrow that down without drawing it in, but we know there's a six in front of it. But the question is, you know, whatever ratio you find, if you divide it and it goes 0.474747, then you know you got it right. So that's just kind of an interesting application. I, I think you do have one question in your assignment about that. So I don't know if it's worth a lot, but the, the business of being able to look at a series that somebody writes out and then write it in sigma notation, that's kind of cool. I suppose that's worth something.
So how would we find out what a fraction is? Because if we just find the limit, it's just going to be 6.4747 forever, right? But or no, just, well, we won't have the six in there if we don't add that in, but. Yeah, well, all right, you talked me into it. Let's do it. So if I said the sum equals 47 one hundredths plus 47 ten thousandths plus 47 millionths and so on and so forth, then you're going to have to multiply by, well, the multiplier, the ratio. And as we saw before, all that does is move the list over once. And so if I multiply 47 hundredths times 100, I'm going to get 47 over 10,000. And if I multiply 47 over 10,000 times 1 one hundredth, I'm going to get 47 over a million. And so don't I get the same exact list again? So then when I say, all right, it's time to now subtract these two equations from each other. Again, what I observe is 47 millionths minus 47 millionths, 47 thousandths. So on this right side, then all I have left is 47 over 100. On the left side, I have 1s minus 1 one hundredth s, which gives me 99 one hundredths s. True. Except for it's negative. No, it's not. It's positive. Are we okay with that? And so if I multiply both sides by 100 over 99, the hundreds cancel. And hence, I get S is 47 over 99. Divide that on your calculator. You will see it goes 47, 47, 47, 47. Now your calculator, sometimes if the last number is a four, um, it'll round it up to a five because it knows the next number off the screen is a seven. So don't be confused by that if that happens to happen. So your knowledge, if you will, of how geometric series work is perhaps the way you were taught this, like back in an algebra class or something. You, you should have seen this someplace before. It's kind of a random topic. So like it, it's very possible that a third of you have never seen never seen how to convert a repeating decimal to its fractional form before. As a shortcut, it turns out that if the whole thing is repeating, like 47, it's always over 99. <clears throat> and if it was, I won't erase this, but if it was like 0.382 repeating, the whole thing is repeating, 382, 382, 382, it'll be 382 over 999. It gets a little more complicated when part of it repeats and part of it doesn't. Um, but anyway, you can use this concept of a geometric series to convert any repeating decimal back to its fractional exact form, getting away from this, you know, a number that goes infinitely long. It's sort of, we, we know what we mean by 828282, but that's a little unsatisfying. And early mathematicians did not use decimals and did not like decimals simply because, well, they, you can't, nobody knows what it is. I mean, yes, it goes forever and you kind of understand there's a pattern to it, but how do I do any math with it if it goes off the screen? And so they would sort of rather do, they'd rather do their math with 47 over 99, in other words, whole numbers, um, than with their decimal counterpart, if that makes any sense. So that's interesting, I think. Um, I think in that vein, it might be worth just one more. I can't remember if you're asked to do this in your assignment, but I think as a skill, it's probably worth doing. So scoot this down just a hair. What about this example? If I if I gave you the geometric series geometric because it goes two fifths to six twenty fifths and then multiplying by well I guess I won't tell you you figure it out 18 over and finally 54 over 625 and I'm kind of out of room right now that's a sequence but if I come back and say now nah, let's add them together and then I go dot 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 now it's an infinite geometric series the question is, 
could you write that in sigma notation, just like we did? Can you recognize what's happening there? Can you recognize it's geometric? This one's harder to start at one than it is at zero. That's an interesting statement. See if you understand what Connor means, means by that. You should sort of notice right away that it's like, oh, look, I'm multiplying by three to get six and I'm multiplying by five to get 25. And the gratifying part of this is when you look at the next one and you go, oh, look, it's also times three and it's also times five, which means, oh, cool. Every term, every term is times three fifths. So automatically then, you know, oh, I'm going to multiply by three fifths a whole bunch of times. And so that's going to be part of it for sure. Three fifths once, three fifths twice. If you find this difficult, which you very well might, you could even write this out. In other words, isn't this, isn't this statement right here two fifths times three fifths? And isn't this statement two fifths times three fifths times three fifths? I mean, that's, that's what I'm showing you there in blue. And so this next one would be two fifths times three fifths times three fifths times three fifths. Like that's that's the pattern I'm seeing. And this is like two fifths times no three fifths. So I could think of this as three fifths to the one. And I could even think of this just as far as a pattern is three fifths to the zero. And so now that I see that, oh, okay. So every one of them has a two fifths in front of it. And then it's just a question of how many three fifths are there? Well, that first one, there's none, and this is why Connor said it's actually easier for this one to start at zero. That's probably the easiest way you'd write this down. So they, they all kind of have the same feel. In other words, the starting, the, the beginning number, like the first number in the series, two-fifths is written right here, two-fifths. Isn't that what ha kind of happened back here too? In other words, if we started at zero, the first number the first number in the series was written right there. That's if we start at zero. So that's just kind of interesting. Again, I don't know how important that is as a skill. But that's kind of cool to be able to write it down that way. So up here in green, you're, you're saying dot, 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 expecting people to kind of see the pattern in the first four numbers and then just recognize it goes forever. Whereas down here, you're literally showing, showing them all. And so, you know, there's an argument that that's a better way to write it. But isn't it more confusing? Like, you know, somebody has to understand the sigma symbol. They have, have to understand what it means that there's an n equals zero and then there's just an infinity sitting up there. They have to understand the language that, oh, that means whole numbers starting at n equals zero, go to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, go forever. And then just what are those values? And then of course the sigma symbol means add them all together. So it's like, that's pretty packed. That's a packed statement right there. You gotta know what every single part of it means in order to kind of make sense of it. So that's just kind of interesting. And yeah, I suppose we could spend some more time trying to figure out, could you start this at one or something like that? But man, let's not do it. So that's kind of cool. All right. But we aren't so lucky with this 
series that I introduced yesterday, because again, you might think, awesome, look, times one times three, sweet, geometric. I come up here, times one, uh-oh, times three, like that should be 18. This is not a geometric series, right? So, huh, what's this gonna add up to? So since that's actually a two, then we can kind of say, you know, uh-oh, I guess I wrote it down below. Uh-oh, not geometric. So we said yesterday, it looks like it will converge because the terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And just to just to remind ourselves, you know, based on this pattern that we see over here, what was really happening? Well, this was one times two, this is two times three, this is three times four, this is four times five. Like that's where the denominator comes from and the four is just a four. And so of course, with respect to this, you know, it looks like it will converge business. If I get way out there, isn't gonna be four over 67 times 68. Like that's, that is gonna be a small number. The individual terms are going to zero. So the question is, is it going there fast enough that this will add up to something? And so let's, uh, let's go over to just to slow down a little bit with this, let's go over to take a look at Excel to kind of see if our, our hypothesis, our conjecture is another mathematical word. We're conjecturing, at least I am, I'm conjecturing that this is going to add up to something. It's going to converge and add up to something. And, and maybe we'll be lucky to see what it is. And I mentioned yesterday because the first term is four over two, that's already two. And the next term is four over six, that's two thirds. We're already at two and two thirds after only two terms. And then we add four twelfths, which is another third, we're already at three. So the first three terms are already at three. So we know it's more than three. So again, let's see if we can make this for ourselves. Let's see, one, two. And then this first term was found by taking equals four divided by this term over here, I guess I need parentheses first, this term over here times one more than that term over there. I think you guys said you can see that okay. It's big enough from what you're seeing in your screen. Do you agree with that? Is that what we said? Yeah, it looks fine. Over n times n plus one. So, so we know the answer to this is two. So, so, okay, cool. That seems to be working. And then if I copy this down, our next term was four over six. Oh yeah. Four over six is two thirds. It looks like it's working. And so if I drag a few of these down and let's go a little slower here. Again, do you see that we're already up to two plus two thirds plus one third. We're already up to three right now. So then if I move down one more term, now I get 0.2. Notice down here it says the sum is up to 3.2. That makes sense. And if I drag that down one more, now our sum's up to 3.33. Do you see how it's slowing down? The sum is slowing down. What do you think? Is it going to make it to 4? Notice it went past pi. That would have been a fun place for it to stop. So unfortunately, is not converging to pi? Let's drag it down a little further. Notice now it's up to 3.71. You think it's going to make it to four? Is it, is it going to land on a nice spot like four? Notice the individual terms are now well on their way to going to zero, right? In order for this to converge, a n, the individual terms, this one right here is a 13. That one is now at 0 0.02. Those are on their way to zero. So that's good. If I drag it all the way down to 32, notice they're even more on their way to zero. So what does this add up to after 32 terms? We'll notice we're up to 3.878. What do you think? I think it's going to be four over one, which would just be four. Because so I feel be like nice it, if it landed on four, right? Because yeah, that's I a, feel like it's going to have a relation like that. So. Mm -hmm. 
let's drag this down a ways. If I grab two of them, I think I could just drag it way the heck down here. Notice they're so small now that they're sort of unrecognizable. And, and so I, it's a little hard for me to grab all these. So I'm going to say equals sum. This is just kind of good for you to know these commands. It's just kind of cool to know them. Equals sum. And I forgot where I started, but it was like E4 or something like that. E4 colon all the way down to where I am, which is E1218. Also, I think you can click on like the letter E, for example, to select that entire column. If you just click at the top there, it should highlight the entire column of numbers. That's exactly right. Kind of kind of shortcuts. What was that you guys just told me the other day? Click. You click in a cell and you hit, what do you hit? A1. Who told me that it was Connor? No, I can't remember it already. Oh, is it up here? A1. I think it's the white box to the left of that. Yeah, in there maybe. There's something wrong with my version of this. Anyway, let's not belabor the point. I think I'm I think I'm okay here. Notice I got to the sum 3.9967 after 1215 terms. And so it does actually look like it's on its way to four, doesn't it? And it turns out it is on its way to four. But again, there's no magic to that. It could be on its way to 4.12695. So just the fact that it looks like it is here doesn't, doesn't mean anything just yet. So again, the point I want to make for us modern mathematicians is if somebody asks you what the limit of this, of this is, you can conjecture that it converges thanks to technology, right? Like we just added up thousand terms and it took us like two seconds. And so that's pretty cool. People couldn't do this before. Not only did they not have a calculator in it or Excel, like they couldn't do any of this stuff. It's just amazing what the ability, our ability to do this stuff, if you will, manually. Again, if you're a true mathematician, I say this a lot, if you're a true mathematician, you're not at all convinced it's four at this point. If you're more of an engineer, it's like, well, it's pretty close to four, so who cares? Close enough, right? Let's, let's get moving. So, know thyself, Socrates said. Are you a mathematician or a practitioner? I'm a practitioner, which is sad. But this particular one is, is discernible because, well, let me show you. So I guess we could say it appears to converge at four, but let's put a giant question mark there because we don't know that for sure. But there's a way to do this one. And that's the thing I want you to understand is, and I, I mentioned this yesterday and a few of you were very disappointed to hear this, but we can, one question is, can you prove that it actually does converge to something? Because that's not obvious. And then secondly, if it does converge to something, well, what does it converge to? And we'd like to know those two things. And disappointingly, there are not very many that you can actually, you can prove they converge to something, but you can't actually figure out what they converge to. Now you can add the first million terms and say it's approximately, you know, 8.26943, but you don't know, you don't know what's happening there. And so anyway, we'll be wading into that. But this is a rare one and it's very contrived and in my opinion, almost goofy, like stupid. Um, it's, it's made as a series that will converge. And let me show you how, or let me show you why. From earlier, let's see, was this earlier this term or last term? Last term, at the end of last term in calculus, you, you saw that this fraction right here, four over n times n plus one, could possibly, thanks to the fact that its denominator is factorable. In other words, it's kind of like saying you have, you know, five, six. Well, hey, look at six. Six is made of three times two. So it's very possible that this could be a fraction before it was added. Some number of thirds plus some number of halves would add up to five, six. So we could split it apart. Well, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to split this apart because we can see that it's broken up. And we're actually going to figure out what its parts are. So if I said this is some number over n, plus some other number over n plus one, 
you're used to adding fractions by going right to left here, but we're gonna actually go left to right. We're gonna unadd this. We're going to use the method of mathematicians would say of partial fractions. We're gonna break it into its two fractions. Well, let's do that mathematically. What comes of this mess? My friends, if we add them together, can you still do this from not so much last term, but just from your logic? Can you say, well, in order to add these, I'd have to find a common denominator. So I'd have to take A and multiply it top and bottom times N plus one so that it had a denominator. And then B needs an N. And so I'd have to multiply the top and the bottom times N. And now, oh yay, look, common denominator. And now we can add those two fractions. Well, if that's true, then isn't it the case that A times N, multiplying this in here, plus A plus B times N is where we're gonna have to get our four. Isn't that what this original fraction has on the top of? Is it a four? So notice these two terms have n's in them. And so the only way we're going to get four is if a is four. Because a is just a number. But notice there's no n's over here. In other words, that doesn't say four plus three n. There's no n's. And so how is a n plus b n going to be no n's? How's a plus b going to be zero? Well, the only way that's going to happen is if b is negative four. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So in other words, if we went back up here and switched out a with four and we switched out b with negative four, those two fractions would really add up to four over n times n plus one. Now, all of that looks like, well, good for you, but who cares? Except for watch what interesting thing happens when I rewrite this series exactly as before, except I split it up into four over N plus negative four over N plus one. I'll just write it as minus. So that's the same statement. You agree with that? It's the same problem we had before. But the summation symbol means add these things, right? So this is just a giant addition problem. So watch what this results in. Well, if I put one in, don't I get four over one plus minus four over two? That's my first term, right? And then my second term is, well, now I stick a two in. So I get four over two minus four over three. And then my third term is four over three minus four over four. What do you see happening, my friends? What do you see happening now that you did not see happening before? Oscillation. Yeah, let me throw in one more set of terms. I don't know why I'm so thinking this is important, but I want to. Dot, dot, dot. If you group these a little bit differently, because I'm just adding them all, right? So now add all those up. Well, what do you notice? These two pair together. These two pair together. They could be, right? Because addition is commutative, mathematicians would say, which matter, doesn't matter what order you, order you add it in. So I'll just add it in the order that I see fit. We'll notice, bam, goes to zero, bam, goes to zero, bam, goes to zero. That's just going to happen forever. So there's your answer, four. So we just proved it. It is four. What we saw in... Excel, what we thought, what we thought was happening actually happened. Again, utterly useless statement right here. This AN, it's utterly useless. This is just a mathematician saying, you know, gosh, are there any other infinite series we can actually add up? And then some, you know, nerds like, I found one. Um, but there's no purpose in this. This is just interesting. So you have some questions in your assignment like this. 
Um, again, your assignment though, I think is kind of interesting because it, because it'll just say, what is, it'll just say, what's the limit of this? Like you can in a sense cheat in Excel and get the answer for now, again, we get a little lucky here because four is a, is a nice landing point, right? But what if it was 4.1? There's nothing in Excel that would have told us that it was exactly four. Why couldn't it be 4.1? Or four and one twentieth or something like that. We don't, we don't know that. So, so there's something to be said for the, you know, the algebra of it. So its limit really is four. I feel like that's the answer you get and then you can't remember how you got there. Like you solved a Rubik's cube and you're like, shit, how did I do that again? <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. What am I doing? <laughs> Hang on, Doug, I have a quick question. Please. So, um, does the, does the fact that that goes on infinitely um, solve the problem of there being always like one left on the end when you're pairing them? That's a wonderful question. Does that bother anybody else? Notice how there was like a minus four fifths. I mean, I said dot, 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 meaning it keeps going, but isn't there always one left on the end that kind of didn't get accounted for? That would technically be zero though, because it'd be so small, right? That's a very good point. So there's two things to consider. One of them is when you get way out there, it's like four over a trillion, right? So it's on its way to zero. The other problem is again, infinity, it never stops. <laughs> so there isn't one at the end because <laughs> there's no end. <laughs> so you really just get four plus zero plus zero. I mean, and maybe that's a good way to write this. If I say, you know, isn't this what actually happens? So I'm, I'm super glad you pointed that out, Becky, because that is interesting. So on both counts, the fact that it's on its way to zero all by itself and the fact that this never stops mean, means that, you know, hey, yeah, there's a negative four fifths there, but right after it, there's a positive four fifths, so it is going to go to zero. Now, collectively, this is called a telescoping. I don't really want you to know this telescoping series. Why do you think somebody gave it that name? I actually don't know the answer to this. I just have my own hypothesis, but why would somebody call that telescoping? And that will be a clue in your assignment, by the way, because they'll say something about it. And you'll, you'll see some assignment questions that sort of have this look to them. They'll kind of look like that. In other words, this only worked because of the n times n plus one, like that's why it worked. So telescoping. So I can only think of two things. I'm thinking of the ship's captain on the old square riggers where they're like, I see land and they hand me the telescope and they go and it telescopes out and then they look through it. Um, that's kind of what happened here. This whole thing collapsed into a bunch of zeros or perhaps you're just looking out there, you know, telescopes see things a long ways away, but you know, somebody thought this was cool enough to give it a name. I mean, that's what mathematicians do. If you find something cool, you think, hmm, that's kind of cool, let's give it a name. Um, on a personal level, I, I disagree with this. This is a super contrived, irrelevant, um, and, and again, maybe I'm naive in saying that, maybe it is relevant to something and either I don't know it, so I'm very ignorant, or Maybe there is a reason, but nobody knows it yet. And it'll be one of you that figures that out. Then it would really deserve a name, I think, if it actually kind of had a purpose. Um, so I have a feeling this is a dead end, but as, as usual, there's an extra credit. Go, go look that up. Is there, you know, who named it telescoping series? When was this discovered? Can you find out any information as to whether this is useful for anything? Or is this just something you show to mathematicians learning about infinite series as you know another series that you can kind of add up and so isn't that fun i don't think it'll be as fun as gabriel's horn but i'll give it a shot i don't think it will be either i'm warning you ahead of time i think there's going to be not much to find about this but i haven't looked so i hope you have some curiosity to you um so i gave you this telescoping series in disguise, but does it make sense? And I think you have some in your assignment like this, you could have been given it like that in the blue where it isn't in disguise. The very fact that one is positive and one is negative, that's why they went away, right? First one is positive, second one is negative. And then secondly, you end up with 
you end up with all the same numbers in there, right? So, you know, when, then, when n was two, this was a three, but then when you move to the next number, now that negative four fourths, you know, now this becomes a three and now you got a positive four fourths. And so it's, it's almost like somebody made it so that all the terms went away just because they thought it would be cool to do so. So my hypothesis, my conjecture, this is nerds at play. This is, that's where this came from, but, but I don't know. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope one of you finds something cool about it and more than happy to humbly eat my words on that in that respect. So armed with that new knowledge, you actually can now prove the limit of a second type of series, not just a geometric series, but now you can actually find the limit of a telescoping series, which is utterly amazing. And so, what I would like to do now, I'm thinking, yeah, I kind of can't help myself. I want to show you this. I want to show you this now. So what I want to do now is, is show you another series. And I want to go down this road a little bit with you. And really, this is a, I guess I'll just stay on the same page here. Really, this is a 10.4 topic. But let's just start talking about it right now. There's a chance I can't be here Monday, in which case maybe we'll get a little ahead and it'll be fine if I'm not here and then we'll all have already taught it. I'll have time on Thursday to teach this to you. But consider this sequence, this series for a minute. Oops. Yeah, we just usually don't use X. We usually use N or K or something like that. One over K squared. And let's start at K equals one and go to infinity. So of course you say, ah, I know what that means. It means stick one in there and then stick two in there and then stick three in there and then stick four in there and so on and so forth. From our earlier discussions, or maybe just from your intuition, is that going to converge? Is that going to have an answer? Remember, that's all converge means, is it goes forever, and yet it still actually has a finite answer. By the way, I, I still hope that's bothering some of you. Like, I still am bothered by the fact that you're adding infinitely many terms, and yet you're saying, you're saying the answer is not infinity. In our last problem, that that will never go over four. It, it doesn't make it to five, doesn't make it to nine, doesn't make it to 10 million. It converged to four. It never makes it there. At least you and I can't make it get there because we're not very good at infinity. But mathematicians say it converges to four. It's on its way to four. If you never stop, you'll make it to four. But I hope that's still bothering some of you. I hope, I hope you're still in the process of, of getting your mind around adding infinitely many things and yet having the answer not be infinity. I don't care how small they are, you're still adding something, right? But the problem is, what are you adding? Something infinitely small. Aren't the individual terms here going to zero? What does this add up to? Now, I think I'm gonna take a second with this. Did I throw that other one away? No, but I think I will throw it away. This one is very dissatisfying. So let's see, all we're doing is taking equals one divided by this number squared. And I'm going to do what I did before just to save a little time here. If I say equals sum, and I say from this colon to this, bam. Now I have the sum there as well. Um, not summer. And I think I'll even I think I'll even write a couple other things up here just so you understand this. Like this is the n and this is the a of n. Isn't that true? So if I 
center those guys and make them bold and make them a little bigger. Before you drag that down, I think you need to go to E3 and hit F4 on uh, D2. You are exactly right. So before I drag this down, that needs to have dollar signs in front of it. Otherwise, it is not going to work. Thank you for reminding me of that, Connor. So do you understand the language here? N is one, N is two, N is three, N is four. A N is the individual term, and then we're going to add them all up, right? So this is, I guess I should say S of N, shouldn't I, instead of just sum. So that S, that's our sum. So what do you think this is going to add up to? So first of all, would you agree it looks like it will converge? And maybe you would even agree, because we did talk about this a while ago, um, the area under the curve, this was a, this kind of came up with Gabriel's trumpet. One over X squared did converge, but one over X did not. So it came up in that discussion. But now let's just start dragging this down a ways. Boom. Uh-oh. Got too many holes in my action there. So notice things that we are not surprised about because this number right here is one over 21 squared. That is a really small number. It's already down to two thousandths. And therefore, we're already seeing this sum converge. Do you agree with that? It really, it'd be, it's, I hope your intuition would say, yeah, this is going to converge for sure. But what, my friends, is very dissatisfying about this particular one? It did not stop at 1.5. Yeah, notice it's not 1.5. Notice our terms are now really small. Let's drag it down further, thanks to Excel. So now I'm just going to go go stupid here for a minute and drag it way down here. Let's drag it down to around a thousand. Would it be cool to go back in time and like take the mathematicians that were trying to, they were the first ones to figure this out in the 1600s and be like, oh, that's easy. Watch this. <laughs> we just did like a year's calculations <laughs> for them. Oh my gosh, that just blows my mind. Um, so you probably agree this looks like it's converging, but notice it is not converging on four. This is very unsatisfying. It's converging on some random decimal in the middle of nowhere in the universe. You agree with that? Yeah. And so does that bother you? Yes. It should. I, I hope there's like, as I've said, I'm, I'm not a inordinately um, theoretical mathematician, but but it's like, this isn't landing anywhere. This is landing in the middle of nowhere. And how would that weird decimal relate to the original summation? Yeah, it's like we're equation. taking squares and it's like, what in the world? Where does this land? And so, but, but again, I want you to understand that numbers don't care. This bothers you and me because we like numbers like four. We don't like numbers like 1.643927. And you can see we're not done. Like that's not the answer. It's just close to the answer. We're not done. It clearly looks like it's converging, but it's not going to converge someplace nice. Now, some of you are thinking, I bet it gets to 6.5. It's 1.65 and then I'm happy, right? Because now it's a, or what about this? What if it makes it to 1.666666? Then would you be happy? I mean, that's one and two thirds, isn't it? That'd be a nice fraction. But, but you understand numbers don't have these, these same idiosyncrasies. You know, you and I want it to be some nice clean fraction or some nice clean decimal. But this really appears to land in the middle of nowhere. And this is the first thing that's going to blow your mind. Um, but looking back at the original sequence, remember it was 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 16 and so forth. Notice. And, it, and I'll just, that's certainly not geometric. You're not multi, so we can't use that technique. It's not telescoping. We can't use that technique. And bad news, friends, we're out of techniques like there aren't any more. So the question, you know, mathematicians have wondered about 
you know, over the years are just, you know, first of all, can you prove this really does come to a stop and converge to something? And then secondly, hmm, I wonder what it converges to. Um, is there some definable location? So I want every one of you, this should tend to chill, chill down your spine or, or you're, you're not human. Bust out your machine. Type, hope I remember this. Type pi squared divided by six. What did you get? Probably what we're going to converge on. <laughs> you got what we're converging to. I already know this, and I got a chill on my spine right now. Like, what? <laughs> What? How? It doesn't seem like it relates to one over n squared at all. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many things that bother me there. There's like, what's pi doing here? Like, pi is circles. <laughs> pi just shows up everywhere. What is the deal with pi? <laughs> Stupid pi. And then, you know, what does six have to do with anything? And why is it squared and like unbelievable? So now, secondly, I'm telling you that's what this is equal to because of experience, but just because somebody, you know, punched a bunch of buttons in their calculator and found something close to this, does that make sense? That isn't that doesn't prove they're actually equal. So, you know, I'm not lying to you. That actually is what this is equal to. But but does it make sense? Somebody could sit there, like you, you could do this with all kinds of numbers. Couldn't I just take e times pi and then divide by 27, divide by 16, and just keep playing around until I found something close to that and go, maybe that's what it's equal to. Um, so it's a far cry between, you know, finding something that looks close and going, hmm, here's a conjecture. I think it's equal to pi times e divided by 16 or something like that. Um, there's, a, there's a big jump between proving it. Because remember, how many terms are here? Infinitely many. So we, we have to have some, well, geometric series technique or some way to, you know, make infinity go away. So we made infinity go away in the telling scoping sequence because we added and saw zeros by writing in a certain way. And we made the geometric sequence go away or the geometric series go away by rewriting two of them that looked identical by the fact that we're able to multiply by something. But what are we gonna do with this? You know, how are we gonna get this to go away? That's very troubling. Stop sharing. So and again, I'm, I'm sort of warning you in advance, there's a lot less about this that we know than we don't know, than we do know. There's less that we know than we actually do know. So it turns out just mathematicians have, have ran down this path. Obviously there's a lot of people smarter than us who've lived a lot more years and even people in the modern age with computers and so forth that have already played in this land and it is true that this is limited to pi squared over six. And so that's very troubling, but there's, there's nothing simple you're gonna be able to do to our series here to kind of prove that that's true. Um, we created what I like to call not a proof, but a poof. <laughs> we went into Excel and we added the first thousand numbers and saw that, wow, actually crazy. It actually does look like it's on its way to that. And by the way, it is converging monotonically. It's working its way up because the first term of this is one. And so it works its way up to 1.6. And so it's just getting closer and closer. So the number we saw in Excel was less than pi squared over six in your calculator, right? Because we're working our way up to it. That's kind of the idea. But this really does have a ceiling. That's the way I like to think of it. It's a ceiling. It's, it's an asymptote. We're working our way up to that number. And if we don't quit, we'll get there. Mind boggling. So from 10.4 forward, we're actually going to be looking at something called a convergence test. And I showed you at the start of this term a note sheet that I have posted in my open math for you, which lists all these convergence tests. I'm flipping to it right now. And 
there is a geometric series test, there's a P series test, an integral test, comparison test, limit comparison test, ratio test, root test, alternating series test. There's all these crazy tests that mathematicians have come up with to prove that something converges. And, and stop and think about this logically. Does it make sense it would be dumb to go looking for the answer to the question if it didn't, if it didn't actually converge to something? So the question is first, can you prove it actually does have a ceiling? It does hit a ceiling. And then secondly, the question is, well, now can we go figure out what it is? Remember, practically you can figure out what it is with Excel every time. <laughs> I mean, close enough, right? Didn't we just figure out that it was 1.6, whatever it was? So, you know, accurate to three decimal places. That's kind of the idea here. So, does it converge? That's kind of the idea. And let's see, is this in your sheet? I think it is. Some books call kind of the first test the divergence. the divergence test. I see that your sheet that I stole out of your book doesn't call it that, it calls it the, also known as the nth term test. I like the, I like divergence test because I kind of like to think of it as you pronounce it like divergence, the divergence test. Does it make sense? We've been talking about this the whole time, but does it make sense if the individual terms are not on their way to zero that it can't add up to something? Don't the terms have to go to zero before you can add infinitely many of them and expect to get an answer? Like that's that's a duh, right? So we see that happening here, right? So the point is the very first test you check is kind of, as I said, duh. This term right here, 1 over 25, is already down to 0 0.04. By the time I get out to 1 over 100, I'm at 0 0.01. Look, these terms are clearly on their way to zero. So are you looking at that sheet that I made? Pull it up, and you probably should print it if you have a printer, but at least be looking at it. Because um, you, yeah, you're going like to this, you're gonna have this sheet when you take tests, and, and I want you to be able to read it just so that it speaks to you. What were you going to say, Raymond? Are we looking at the, the P series part on the, yeah. on the page? I'm looking at the very first one. Let me see. Oh, okay. The very top line, it says the nth term test or the zero test. That's, that's the name of it. One of the names of it. But notice it says under convergence or there's like four columns. It says under convergence, it diverges if the limit of the individual terms is not equal to zero as n goes to infinity. Does that speak to you? Like that looks like a complicated state statement, but it just needs to speak to you. In other words, the individual terms, as I wrote here, a n has to go to zero as, as n goes to infinity. Of course it does. Of course the terms out there have to get really small. Duh. So check that first. That's kind of the idea. As an example, and this is this is what this class is now about for the rest of chapter 10. In my opinion, this class gets a little bit I don't know if dull is the right word, because again, I think the fascinating part of this is, is, is if you can show something does converge, then let's go figure out what it converges to. Like, that's so cool to just to think that you can create a statement like this that, that adds up to something and like maybe no one's ever thought of it and, you know, nobody knows what the answer is and it's like you could be the one to try to figure that out. But what this class becomes is just people make up some random irre irrelevant statement like I just made up right there. And then they say, does this converge or diverge? Well, look at the individual terms. If I stick in zero, I get zero over two, which is zero. 
If I stick in one, I get three over three. If I stick in two, I get six over four. If I stick in three, I get nine over five. If I stick in four, I get 12 over six. Notice the terms aren't on their way to zero. Well, I guess we don't know that, do we? Do we know they're on, not on their way to zero? If I write them as decimals, what are they? This is 1.5, this is 1.8. I think I did something wrong because I don't, no, that's, no, that's right, I'm, I'm okay. So notice the terms seem to be getting bigger, not smaller. So if this is my an equation, that's my formula for an, can anybody tell me what is the limit of an as n goes to infinity? What is What are these terms on their way to? Notice they went from 1 to 1 1.5 to 1.8 to 2. The next one out there that I didn't write would be 15 over 7. What, what is it on its way to? You should be able to answer that. What happens to 3n over n? plus two as n goes to infinity. Does it go to infinity? No, it doesn't. That's a good conjecture. What difference does the two make if you stick infinity in there? No difference at all. Pretty much non-existent. So this is pretty much like three n over n and the n's cancel. Infinity over infinity is, is kind of like a number. I mean, it, again, infinity is not a number, but it, when n is 10,000, isn't that 3 times 10,000 divided by 10,000? These terms are on their way to 3. It started at 1. By the time we stopped, it got up to 2. If I keep on going, they're going to work their way to 3. And, by, and, you know, bust your calculator out. Type in 999. What's 3 times 999 over 999 plus 2? I'm doing it right now. 3 times 999, nine, nine. that's a pretty big number. It's not infinity, but it's a pretty big number. Divided by 999 plus 2. I got 2.994. See how it's on its way to 3? So that can't possibly add up to something, right? Because in the end, what do you have? Remember, you're adding them. So every time it's like plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Does it make sense? It does not pass the divergence test or the nth term test. Those terms have to go to zero. So this has to converge. I'm sorry, this has to diverge because the terms aren't going to zero. Does that concept make sense? That's kind of your first test. I'm a little confused. I thought it had to be on its way to zero in order to be a finite number. That's exactly right. This is on its way to three. In other words, our series here is going to become plus three, 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 plus three forever. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Therefore, when you try to add them up, what are you going to get? You're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. So it will diverge because it's not going to add up to something. It's just going to get bigger. Every time you add one more term, it gets three bigger. Whereas what have we been seeing with the problems I've been giving you? You're pretty much adding zero. Therefore, the sum isn't changing very much from term to term, right? Isn't that what we just saw with 1 over x squared a second ago? We saw that it was kind of landing on 1.6. Well, if you add 3 to that, it's going to get bigger. So not equal to 0. Hence, this has to diverge. This is not going to add up to something. I get that it diverges, but when you got rid of the two on the bottom to see what the individual numbers go to. Couldn't we kind of do the same thing with the three? Because it's still going to be infinity, I guess. Like yeah, three except times. For, because, except for it's sort of three times infinity divided by infinity. And, and, and again, if you put, you know, a large number in there for to stand for infinity, like even a relatively small one, like 999, if you take three times 999 divided by 999, you're going to get three. So, so the two is less relevant than yeah. or addition, I guess. Exactly. That makes sense. Addition is less relevant. Now, if I said you're not adding two, but you're adding two ends to it, that changes things because now you're adding two big numbers, but you're just adding a two. That's nothing. 
I got you. So again, play with this stuff. Like you don't have to just do this theoretically, like bust out your Excel and write down the first 200 turns and you'll see it going to three. Based on what I did here, it should actually start at one and it's gonna get close to three from below because you're right, Martin, the two makes a difference. The two makes the bottom a hair bigger, which sort of forces the number to be a hair smaller than three. You're never gonna make it to three. You're never gonna stick a number in and get three, but you're gonna get close to three. It's on its way to three. So we say the limit is three, even though you're never, you can't pick, pick it, you can't pick any number and plug it in for n and never get three, unless it's infinity, but that's not a number. So that's kind of your first test. And then we already looked at your second test, but I just want to note it. Your second test is the geometric series test. If it's a geometric series, when did we say? So yeah, if it has to be a geometric series, and that's a super common one, by the way. We saw it come up with money and the way trees grow. Like it comes up in nature. We didn't just make it up. Like it comes up naturally. That's where you repeatedly multiply by a percentage. If your tree grows 5% today and then 5% tomorrow and 5% the next day and 5% the next day, you're repeatedly multiplying by 5%. And so that'll create a geometric series. So, so geometric series is a sort of real, they're not a mathematician's contrivance that has no purpose, like I'm proposing a telescoping series is. But when does the geometric series converge? Converges if and only if, have you seen that phrase before? If and only if the R value we said was less than one or greater than negative one not less than or equal to, less than. In other words, your percentage is less than 100%. If you only have 99% today of what you had yesterday, then you're gonna run out of money. So, and notice on your sheet, it even says, it even says it converges to A over one minus X. Isn't that what we showed the other day? Except for I was using the letter R. A over one minus R. In, in their example, X is the is the kind of the R value. So they say it diverges if the absolute value of X is more than one. So they're saying that in a kind of a confusing way, but it diverges if R is greater than or equal to one, or if R is less than or equal to negative one. A faster way to say that, absolute value of R is greater than or equal to one. That's a faster way to say it, a more annoying way to say it, but a faster way to say it. So again, I'm interested in you being able to read your sheet. Can you read what that's saying there? So they're saying it diverges if the multiplier is more than one. Again, if it's more than one, don't the terms get bigger, 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 bigger? And then we have the divergence test happening. In other words, the terms are getting bigger and bigger. So there's no way you're gonna be able to add them up and have it come turn into something. But if that percentage that you're multiplying by is less than 100%, then the terms get smaller, smaller, smaller. Oh, they're going to zero, then it might add up to something. And in fact, it does. And we've been able to achieve that numerous times since you can actually work with the geometric series. Thirdly, on your sheet is another very important test called the P-series test. We've been playing around with this a little bit, and that's the reason I'm bringing this up right now, because this one that we just did back here, where did, where did you go? This one right here was a P-series type of problem. So, so read the sheet. Can you, can you see what it's saying? And, let, and let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll be done for today. Well, what's the P-series test saying? Somebody the exponent to needs to be greater than one for it to converge. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even write it a little different. So it's X to the P power. Remember, we saw that one over X, which would be one over X to the first power, I'm going to change color so that stands out, 1 over x to the first, that diverged, didn't it? 
and I'll, I'll, re, I'll reintroduce that a little bit here, but we saw that diverged. But earlier we saw that if P is actually bigger than one, then it will actually converge. Notice for our problem a second ago, the, the P value was two. So that's going to converge. So that converges by the P series test. Now, let's remind ourselves why that was. Let's just play with this for a second. We'll remind ourselves why. So if P is greater than one, it converges. If P is, what does it say, less than or less than or equal to? Yeah, less than or equal to one. Then it will diverge. But let's play with this. Let's go back and just take a quick look at Gabriel's horn. Remember the integral? We said, what's the integral of one over X? If you work your way from x equals 1 to infinity, and we said, what's the area under that curve, Gabriel's horn? And we said, well, I know what the integral of 1 over x is. It's the natural log of x. And then we need to evaluate that at infinity and at 1. And so we, in a sense, have, again, mathematicians don't like writing like this, but we have this. That's our answer, right? What's the natural log of 1, though? Hmm. Zero. zero zero so the question is you know what's the natural log of a large number well the natural log of infinity is on its way to infinity now remember of all the uh, types of functions that exist in the world the natural logarithm was the slowest one there was remember that natural log goes the natural log of a large number goes to infinity incredibly slowly this goes to infinity very, very, how many E's are in the word? Very, very, very slowly. And again, we, we do this again in your calculator really quick, but just take the natural log, I'm doing this, the natural log of nine, 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 I just threw a ton of nines in there and I got 32. Wow, natural log is really slowing a number down. Like I was having the number go to infinity, but when you take the natural log of it, wow, does it ever slow it down? You can't get there, like you can't get any closer. This is what the P-series test is saying. This is as close to not going to infinity as you can possibly get. If you go a hair past this, this is what we said. If you go just a hair higher, 1.01. .01. What happens now? What's the area under that curve? Would you agree it's almost the same curve? 1 over x, 1, o 1 over x to the 1, 1 over x to the 1.01. .01. What happens when you take that integral? Well, remember that becomes, you can actually do this one with the power rule. You don't need a logarithm. Logarithm is a very special case. The integral of that is you add one to it, so it becomes x to the negative 0.01, and then you divide by 0.01. Isn't that what you do for the integral? Yep, that's you, looking right. If you tried that with one over x, that would be, I'll, I'll erase this, but it'd be x to the negative one. When you add one to that, you get zero, and then you divide by zero. So now you have x to the zero over zero, it explodes. But if that's not a one, now, all of a sudden, you can actually do it. To write this a little more cleanly, and I guess I should not be lazy. I should stick these in. To write that a little more cleanly, this would be negative 1 over 100 x to the point zero 0.01. Am I right about that? Negative 1, 100. I'm not right about that. That's wrong because on the bottom, I have one one hundredth. So that would be actually a hundred on the top. 
That's what it would be. So what is negative 100 over infinity? Again, I'm purposely writing this in a way mathematicians hate. Mathematicians are going to say, they, they say infinity is not a number. You can't write it that way. You got to write negative 100 over n to the 0 0.01 and then say as n goes to infinity. I get why they say that, but you understand this, right? Like, let's not make it complicated if we don't have to. Be able to do both. That's, that's the right way to do this. What's infinity to the 0 0.01 power? still infinity still infinity like it's going to get there slowly because remember you're taking the one one hundredth root again i'm taking nine 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 bunch of nines and i'm raising it to the point zero one power and i got 1.4 it's not obvious but that's actually still on its way to infinity so this is on its way to negative 100 over infinity, which is get back here, which is on its way to zero, isn't it? 100 divided by a large number is zero. And then you have negative 100 over one to the point zero one. That's actually negative 100. So collectively, you have zero minus negative 100. You have an actual finite area. The area under that curve is 100. Now, you need infinity to be infinity. <laughs> like I just typed in like 12 nines. And it was a long ways from infinity. Like this is one of the few times you need infinity to really be infinity. I typed in like 12 nines raised to the 0 0.01 power. And it was only 1.4. Like that is not going to infinity very quickly. But that's what this is getting at. Like the area under that curve, the area under that curve has a finite answer when it's 1 over x to the 1.01. But the area over 1 to the x to the 1 doesn't have an answer. And that's the line. So that's what the p-series test is saying. If it's over 1, even if it's a hair over 1, again, 0 0.01 is not very satisfying. I, I sort of regret doing it now, actually, because it seems so small. It almost feels like it isn't working. Um, so this one's on its way to 100 very slowly, too. And I think our machinery is going to break down. Like if you try to go to Excel to do this, it's not going to, we're not going to be able to see it. We're not going to be able to see this approaching 100 with the technology we have. We'd have to be using like a, a computer, a genuine computer program and let it run an iterative loop and like go out and come back a week later and see what the sum was or something while it was calculating numbers and so forth before we'd see, yeah, actually it is on its way to 100. It's, it does seem to have a limit. It really does, even though that's a, infinite area remember even though this is still an infinite area an improper integral even though it goes forever it actually has a finite answer it's not going to go over 100 so we'd sort of need a supercomputer if you will to see that so the p series really represents the line the line between it doesn't quite converge to it does super interesting So we now have three convergence tests. Do you see that as kind of dull? Again, this is the, what kind of a person are you? Are you a mathematician? Do you see it as like, oh, that's pretty, pretty cool. We have ways to kind of prove it now. Or do you think, oh, that's no fun. Like, I don't, I don't want to just know if something converges. I want to know what it converges to and so forth. Um, 
So we'll pick it up here tomorrow because we're out of time. But did you notice we just used an integral? We just used an integral to kind of check to see if something worked. Well, that's the next test, the integral test. So we're going to pick it up there tomorrow. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to waste any more of your time because I need to let you out of here talking about it now. But but what we just did right there is kind of the intuition behind why the integral test actually works. And so that's a really important test too. And so we'll take a look at that. Take a look at that then. Um, but let's call it a day today. And as always, stay after if you want. Remember the peer series test though, just tells you that it does converge. It tells you that this converges, but it doesn't tell you pi squared over six. It just tells you, yep, that's going to have an answer because P is more than P is two. Two is more than one. That's going to converge to something. So one over K cubed is going to converge to something. One over K to the fourth is going to converge to something. But, you know, I don't know if we know what it is. One over K to the 1.1 is going to converge to something, but I don't know if we know what it is. I don't know if there's any way to know what it is. Apparently some nerd figured it out. That's the mystery that I want to leave you with today. All right, get out of here. See you tomorrow. Thanks, the great lesson. Neat, neat stuff. Bye. Hey Doug, I was talking about this problem at work that was pretty hard for everyone to grasp. And I wanted to know if you had heard of it. It's called the Monty Hall problem. Yeah, I have heard of that. Does it make sense to you? Yes. So do you always change doors or do you keep your door? Change. All right. Thanks, man. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. So um, I told my dad that we were learning about the series and sequences in our uh, class this term. And he mentioned uh, if you knew anything about the square root of zero, just it's not exactly zero, I think he said, but it's supposed to be like a really tiny number because you're taking the square root of increasingly small numbers. So it just approaches zero. Is that what's going on? Yeah, in other words, it'd be like saying not, not what's the square root of zero because that's zero, but what's the square root of n as n goes to zero. And yeah, square roots make numbers really small, it takes nines and makes threes out of them, it takes a hundred and makes a 10 out of it, it takes, you know, one, well, and makes one out of it. But what does it do with, you know, smaller numbers? And so, you know, if I bust out my calculator and say, what's the square root of 0.1? It says 0.3. Wait a second. Notice it's getting bigger. It took 0.1 and made 0.3 out of it. So, yeah, I mean, it is this in a sense. I, I don't, I don't have any uh, familiarity with that as like some question that mathematicians are pondering, if you will. Um, but the concept that the square root of a number really close to zero is still really close to zero is an interesting one. But, but as I said, what's interesting is if I take 0 0.001 and take the square root, I get 0 0.03. So it's still on its way to zero, but it's actually bigger than the number you put in there. Does that make sense? So I put 0 0.001 in there. I took the square root of it and I got 0 0.03. So it's on its way to zero, but it's a little bigger than zero. So maybe that's the question in other words, the number is a hair bigger, whatever you take the square root of, it's a hair bigger than that number. And so the question is like, the number I'm taking the square root of is on its way to zero, but the other number is going there more slowly. And so I can see where that question is coming from. I've never heard any discussion about that before, but, but what's the nature of the square root of it? It's interesting. And yeah, I just put in, Point zero 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 one, and I got point zero zero one. That is weird that it's just a little bigger. Yeah, and that's because you know square root means well, what number squared gives me my number? Like the square root of nine is three because three squared is nine. And so if you say I would like to get point zero one, well, what number squared is point zero one? Point one. So it actually has to get a little bigger. So the square root of the numbers as long as the number is less than one, is bigger than the number itself. So yeah, I can see that as a, I mean, that's, that's why many mathematicians go, either go insane or, you know, start thinking religious thoughts or whatever, because it's like, wow, you know, what is, what's, where is that? And 
people have investigated whether there's different types of infinities. Like infinity is just a big number, but what's infinity to the second power? Is that any bigger? So like that's a place people have wondered. And the answer to that turns out to be yes. There actually are different types of infinity, which is very troubling. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you mentioned we might not have class on Monday. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. I'll probably know tomorrow if that's true or not. So. All right. I'll see you tomorrow then. Sounds good. See you tomorrow. Will you ever go over how the hell pi over or pi squared over six has got there? Or is that always going to be a... Yeah, that's no, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think if I even know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I only taught this class once before, and I can't remember if I investigated that or not. Because it, it demands proof for sure, which means somebody has proved it. The question is how, how, what's the line of reasoning that got you there? And so, yeah, I'm actually going to Google search that. Yeah, I can see a bunch of P-series tests popping up or questions popping up that just kind of bug me. I don't, it's not like that important. It just kind of bugs no, me, I guess. In my opinion, that is the most important. Like the fact that something converges is not that interesting to me. What does it converge to? Especially that example. And even and, and I'm enough of a mathematician that I don't care if that applies to something. That's just crazy. That is that is order in the universe that just blinds my eyes to think that that adds an adds pi in it. What are you talking about? No. Yeah, that dude must have been a nerd, bro. <laughs> that dude is a nerd. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, and again, the other thing I find amazing is I found that, you know, on the online or wherever, looking in a book someplace, but somebody at some point, somebody didn't know the answer. Like they had proved that it converged maybe based on the P-series test. And then they started thinking, well, this is just too cool to not know the answer to. So I wonder how many years it, you know, months or days or what they, you know, what did they do to to come up with the answer to that and how did pi get involved and so forth and so um that is something we're going to tackle um let me see what sections would that be in i can't remember what the topics cover so i gotta look yeah the very the very next section once we kind of take the test over this is is using these infinite series to start approximating things um Another magical mystery is if you take E, which is a crazy number, and pi, which is a crazy number, and I, which is a crazy number, I is the square root of negative one, pi is involved with circles, and E we've been looking at lately, but it has to do with things that grow infinitely many times, but infinitely small, and, they're, and, then, it, and then you type that in your calculator, and the calculator says it's negative one, <laughs> which is minus what? <laughs> so like all those buttons are on your calculator type it in yourself um, but we are gonna we're gonna travel down that road so in chapter 11 so we're, we're going to figure out we are going to figure out how that how pi squared over six how that's created and it's not like i thought of it as guesswork i i sort of foolishly thought of it as somebody's like mushroom hunting like they're just walking around. It's like, I'm gonna find some mushrooms and they just keep walking and keep walking and everybody else gives up and quits because they're tired or whatever. And this one person just keeps walking and then they find it, you know, like, oh. But no, you, they built this. Like pi squared over six is, is a logical outcome of a process that we're gonna talk about in chapter 11. So it isn't, it isn't just luck. It isn't somebody just busting out a calculator and just throwing pi in there and going, well, if we divide by four, no, divide by, Five, no, six, yeah, that's pretty close. Sure, we'll call it that. It wasn't guessing. It wasn't randomly happening upon the mushrooms on the forest floor. It was entirely built. So a lot of what we're doing in chapter 10 is building the groundwork um, for the important payoff that this is gonna give us in in chapter 11, so. so I gotcha. During this class, will we like, I mean, after it, will we have the groundwork to come up with that answer? Or should I just go no, you Google will. search for it? No. We will? Yeah, we'll have the groundwork to, to build that from scratch. Yep. And gotcha. for the pi i being negative one, we'll be able to build that too. Like, 
So there is some some cool stuff coming. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'd actually recommend you just be patient. I'll try my best. Let your skills, <laughs> let your skills build. I won't. I won't look it up. I was just curious because I don't know. It was. <laughs> yeah. No, you should be. A, that's a weird number. I know. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. <laughs> oh, amazing stuff. Alrighty. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. See you guys tomorrow.